Listener discretion is advised. Buongiorno, Don Gamanetti. Mi pare stiate bene. È così. È la vostra famiglia. Sanno bene pure loro. The two men talking here are Antonino, Giamona and Dr. Galati. Per quale ragione siete venuto qui? Per chiedervi di finirla. Finire che cosa? The year is 1872 and we are in Sicily. Giuseppe Galati, a doctor from Palermo, has just inherited a 10-acre citrus grove from his late brother-in-law who died under suspicious circumstances. But instead of booming, like every other farming business in the area, it is destitute. And something just doesn't feel right. Dr. Galati, in a final act of desperation, has decided to come and talk to the local godfather, Antonino Giamona. Finirla con questa campagna di intimidazioni nei miei confronti e verso i miei operai. The man considered to be the very first mafia boss of bosses. Non so proprio di cosa stiate parlando. Sto semplicemente cercando di condurre una vita onesta. This is the story of the rise and fall of the most famous gang in history. In the last episode, we were introduced to the Italian-American Mafia, a franchise version of a centuries-old organized crime unit, which began in Sicily in the 1800s. By the 1990s, these men of honor had become corrupted. The best of them gone, replaced by those who succumbed to ego, pride, and profit. The world thinks it knows all about the Mafia. There are countless films, books, and TV series depicting the deepest secrets of this notorious organization. Its origins, however, are a much more hidden story. I'm Michael Caine, and for Audible Originals, this is Gangs, Episode 4, Omerta. Sicily is just off the toe of the boot-shaped Italy. It is the biggest island in the Mediterranean Sea, a land rich with history and tradition, a place where art and culture intertwine with awe-inspiring natural beauty. I'm not paid by the tourist board of Sicily, but if that doesn't sell it enough, it's old King Frederick II once said, I don't envy God's paradise because I'm well satisfied to live in Sicily. And it was in this paradise on earth that Dr. Galati's beloved brother-in-law, a respected and popular guy in the community, ran his successful business, a lemon grove, and lemons were booming. It was a shock to everyone when he suddenly collapsed out of the blue. The local doctor said it was a heart attack brought on by stress. The distraught Galati came in to handle affairs at the farm. Already devastated at the loss of a close friend and family member, he found something curious, something that didn't make any sense. He found that the business was in a disastrous state. John Dickey is a professor of Italian studies at University College London. He's written many books on the Sicilian Mafia, so he knows all about this particular story of the beleaguered lemon farm, which should have been, shall we say, a more fruitful enterprise. I mean, it was the result of a lot of investment, irrigation channels, it even had a modern coal-fired steam pump to pump water and so on. But it wasn't making any money. Lumbered with this struggling business, Galati's at real risk of going broke and he couldn't work out what had gone wrong. Lemons were the most profitable industry in Sicily. And with 10 acres on the farm, this should have been a breeze. Because to truly understand Sicily, we really do have to get to understand lemons. <laughs> 
The lemons were an important source of income for the Sicilian economy. That's Antonio Nicasso, a professor at Queen's University in Ontario. He's written more than 30 books about the Mafia, and he really knows his lemons, too. Since the British Royal Navy discovered that the lemons were a cure for scurvy, a disease caused by lack of vitamin C, lemon started to be in great demand in Europe and in northern South America. They sold particularly well in New York. Today, of course, they've grown all over the world, but back then, Sicily enjoyed a monopoly on the market, and the whole country was profiting. So Galati's new business should have generated big profits to, well, ease the pain of his brother-in-law's passing a little. Instead, he finds financial ruin. He meets his new staff, including a particularly confident young man by the name of Benedicta Carollo. A little too confident, perhaps. For Carollo, the failing business was a roaring success. Benedetto Carollo, who was the delegated manager and guard of the Lemon Garden, was raking off money left, right and centre. No wonder he's so relaxed. Carollo would steal the coal from the coal-fired pump the Lemon Garden had and basically steal the crop that had already been sold, or at least parts of the crop. Suddenly, that heart attack was beginning to make sense. Galati got so fed up with all this thieving that he tried to sell the lemon grove. And when people came to view it and see it, Carollo would scare them off. Of course, why would Carollo ruin a good thing? Life had given him lemons and, well, I'll let you finish that one. So faced with his inability to sell or do anything with this lemon garden and stop Carollo and his men leeching money from it, Galati sacks him and recruits another man as warden of this lemon garden. And the farm went on to become the great success it always should have been for Galati and his family. Except it didn't. The new warden was on a daily basis harassed and bullied. Threatening letters were delivered by shady men who turned up at the farm, strongly suggesting that Carollo should be rehired. Eventually, the replacement warden that Galati had appointed was murdered. He was shot in the back near the lemon garden itself. So Galati was left with a vacancy and a rather hard job to sell to a new recruit, you would have thought, given the circumstances of the last employee's um, departure. Galati managed to find another replacement warden, a man called Kuzumano, who did the same job. And in due course... Kusumana too is shot in the back. But crucially, his shooting is not fatal. And he decides to give evidence and he gives a testimony because he saw the man who shot him was Benedetto Carollo, the original warden. Galati's also been holding on to the threatening letters and noting down in his diary descriptions of the men who pop round to, not so kindly, suggest their old pal for rehire. He's building a case of evidence. Galati then decides to 
look after Cusumano himself. He puts him up in accommodation paid for by Galati because he's hoping finally to use Cusumano's testimony to get the police involved and get him the help that he needs from the state. There's an attempted murder, there's an eyewitness, there's a motive, and easy arrest for the force, surely. Galati goes to see the local police inspector Matteo Ferro, who was very earnest, very eager, says, yes, of course, I'm going to do something about this. And then he arrests two men who have got nothing to do with Benedetto Carollo or the Lemon Garden, and who, surprise, surprise, are released for lack of evidence soon afterwards. You can probably guess what's happened. A case of who you know, not what you know. So Galati tries to take it a stage further. He goes to see the then chief of police of Palermo, Pietro Biundi, he's called. And Pietro Biundi says, yes, of course, we're going to do something. Galati hands over threatening letters that he'd received that seem to point the finger at the culprits for the attack on Cusumano. Chief of police reassures him, and then, lo and behold, the chief of police had merely handed the case back to Inspector Matteo Ferro. The culprit was arrested, but then released again after a couple of hours. And the policeman said, oh, it was all a misunderstanding. So, Galati asks for his file of evidence back. And in the process of this, the most incriminating of the threatening letters that Galati had handed over disappeared. So it's looking like Carollo and his people are not only extortionists and murderers, but they've got the police in their pockets too. There are whispers of an organisation in Sicily, a secret network, if you will. But surely they couldn't have infiltrated the police. Galati still hopes that with the testimony of Cusumano, who he's still nursing, he will be able to get the police involved. And his hopes are raised because there is a change in chief of police and a change in inspector and in his area. And he takes the evidence to them. Corollo is finally arrested, taken into custody, and it looks like Galati's luck is changing at last. By now we're in the summer of 1875. Things are going to finally turn out favourable for Galati. But then his patient, Cusumano, his warden, gets up, walks off, and is next seen having a celebratory banquet with Carollo, he's not going to testify because he's made peace. Yet again, this doesn't make sense to Galati. The man he nursed back to health from the brink of death is drinking, laughing and celebrating with the very man who shot him. Is Cusumano himself now part of their little gang? It turns out Cusumano had cut a deal with a local landowner a man closely associated with Carollo, the original warden, a man who was incredibly well connected with the local police, the priests and government, and Tonino Giamona, the guy we heard about right at the start. It dawns on Galati that maybe Giamona was at the center of this conspiracy. In his frustration, he wrote a letter to a friend, a letter that we still have today. And the first physical evidence we have that this secret society even exists. He named the men who harassed him as men of honor, the mafia. By the time they have a name, they're already too late to stop. 
1874, the year when the Galati story starts, there were 34 murders in one village of Uditore, which is the village right next to where this lemon grove is. 34 murders in a village of 700, 800 inhabitants. The Mafia was already here. It's obvious why the Mafia are targeting lemon farms. It's the money, of course. But by the time we even know who they are, they've already infiltrated trusted offices of law and order. And to understand how they achieved this, we need to brush up on our Sicilian history. Sicily was known in the first half of the 19th century as a cauldron of revolution. Before 1871, Sicily was independent from Italy. The nobility had owned most of the land, but in 1860, during bloody revolution, Sicily became unified with mainland Italy. After unification, much of the land and wealth was redistributed to the church and to private citizens. So for the first time, land was subject to market forces. Ownership, renting could be passed on. Amid this upheaval, a group of like-minded people joined together and saw an opportunity. An opportunity to take advantage of the chaos around them. They called themselves the Mafia, a.k.a. the Cosa Nostra, meaning our thing. Professor Antonio Nicasso again. The Italy uh, unification uh, uh, created a vacuum that many mobsters were able uh, to fill it, in the sense that uh, many mobsters were selected to represent uh, the people in charge for law and order. So their thing begins to creep into all sorts of useful places through very useful people. From lords to police chiefs to clergymen, and they take lessons from other underground organizations. They learn uh, about many things, uh, how to structure themselves uh, during uh, the first uh, half of 1800. They get inspired by political uh, dissident. The rights use uh, have been shaped liberally from those of the secret society uh, of the past, like the Freemason and uh, religious and chivalric uh, practices. The mafiosi learn the importance of uh, myth, ritual and symbols, all things that create a sense of identity and a sense of belonging. And like a flock of magpies, sometimes fittingly referred to as a mischief, the Mafia also stole the shiniest rituals to feather their nests. Mafiosi are very unusual criminals in that they have an ideology. They incorporate religion into their code of belief. Rituals, religion and pageantry are already a huge part of Catholic Sicilian culture. The Mafia are no different. Already at the time of Dr. Galati, the Mafia gang in the area had a priest as a protector. Almost all Mafia bosses are religious and they twist religion into something that they can use for their ideology. They love the sense of prestige and legitimacy that comes from a big church wedding to seal a Mafia alliance or from their ability to infiltrate the ceremony of a local saint and to be able to walk down the street arm in arm with the priest. Those sorts of things are crucial to the way that the Mafia over a century and a half has mystified and confused its power, but also given its members kind of self-belief, given them excuses for what they do. They were doing God's work, or so they convinced themselves. They used religious connections to justify the violence that's necessary to maintain a criminal empire. 
with this idea of the ritualization and sacralization of violence, they can convert themselves from a murderer to a punisher. Someone that had to kill, someone that was forced to kill that individual in order to protect the organization in a very sophisticated psychological construct. And crucially, it allowed them to absolve themselves of any guilt. The analogy by the political dissident was to free the forest from the wolves. In other words, they said you had to rid the country of enemies in any way possible. And the mafiosi apply the same principle. They justify any violence to protect the organization from betrayal and enemies. In other words, it is your fault if the Mafia has to hurt you. You deserve this. You have managed to provoke an organization that's as sacred as the church. These are men of honor, after all. This is where we see the beginning of the hallowed ritual, the Mafia initiation something that still survives to this day in Mafia chapters across the world. But it's so secretive that until this century, no one could even confirm it existed. This is the ritual that we revealed in episode three, that Gotti, Gimona, every made Mafia man has gone through since the organization began. And once you know where the Mafia came from, the meaning behind this ceremony begins to make sense. John Dickey. To be initiated into the Mafia, you usually have to have killed somebody beforehand. You will have been watched over and judged carefully. You will have had a kind of background check to make sure you've got no relatives in the police or anything like that. If you're something more like a professional, a doctor or so on, obviously the murder requirement is usually uh, not observed. But the mafiosi are the criminal elite. It takes years to work your way up. You might be in your thirties before your criminal CV is sufficiently full. And you officially get the job when you're initiated into the organization. And the ritual begins and when the moment comes, your godfather, presiding over your baptism as a mafioso, ushers you into a darkened room. There is a table. At the centre of the table, crossed, there is a gun and a knife. Ora, avete inteso perché siamo qui? Sì. And sitting round the table, or standing round the table, is a representative sample of the members of your, your new family, your Mafia family. Una volta che si entra a far parte della famiglia Gambino, non c'è via di uscita. You stand next to the Mafia boss, who explains the rules of the Mafia to you, how you must never speak to the authorities, but always come to the boss instead if you've got a problem, how you must never look at the wives and girlfriends or sisters of other mafiosi, and so on and so forth. Nessuno conta al di fuori della famiglia. When you've been told the rules, then you proffer your right hand, your trigger finger is taken and pricked, so that blood starts to drip out. The blood is dripped onto a sacred image, a playing card sized image of the Madonna of the Annunciation, usually. And then the boss gets you to cut that image in your hands and he sets light to it. And while the flames are burning, you recite the oath. Che la mia carne bruci. May I burn like this saint. Come questo santino di San Pietro. Like this sacred image. If I ever betray Cosa Nostra. And at that point, with the ashes of the card in your hands, that metaphor 
of your complete transformation from one state of being into another, you are a man of honor. The very same principle that would become central to the Italian-American Cosa Nostra over a century later. This is the Mafia mindset. They believe they are forced to act in secret, to protect their organization, and guard against foreign interests that are trying to destroy their society. These are men of honor who must band together to fight for what is right. The ideas of secrecy, honor, family, these are universal concepts and they make for some great stories. Most notably, The Godfather. And the Godfather really leans into this idea of Italian organized crime as secretive, mysterious and enigmatic, and therefore glamorous. Eleni Jones, our film and television expert. It really makes their lives seem noble and motivated by familial duty and respect and honour and all these admirable traits. We know from the previous episode that Gotti and his pals in 1970s New York were certainly influenced by the film. Why wouldn't they be? It was a cinematic masterpiece depicting the ancient fraternity that was central to their lives. Despite how removed the American organization had become from its origins in Sicily, it was a reminder of their roots. Francis Ford Coppola, the director of The Godfather, was heavily influenced by the mythology surrounding the original mafiosi. Coppola wanted to make a film that looked gorgeous. It's painterly, it's kind of allowed to linger. The storytelling takes its time. It's both classical and respectful. It's much more rooted in opera and theatre and Shakespeare, you know, these big Shakespearean tragic characters. Just like the Mafia portrayed themselves, good men forced to do bad things to protect their family. Very Shakespearean. Those scenes of, of Michael Corleone walking through rural Sicily with, you know, his new Sicilian friends and spotting his first wife for the first time and their wedding and everything, which is essentially a tragedy about a great powerful man brought low by a tragic flaw and all these great classical themes of betrayal and family. A plot recap for anyone who's forgotten and a spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, although it's nearly 50 years old, so get a move on. Michael Corleone, a man forced to act to protect his father, returns home to Sicily, where he reconnects with his romantic past, only for his new wife to be killed in a bomb meant for him. Hard times create hard men. And these hard men create dynasties. The Godfather trilogy is a story of the Mafia, but it's also a story of immigration. It wasn't just lemons that were shipped from Sicily to America. It was a lot of Sicilians too. People with values, with codes of honor, they bring with them from the Mafia. We've already seen in how the Corleone family is disrespected by a lot of the American establishment because they're immigrants. So this is a way of kind of showing the noble narrative of the immigrant that they brought these values from the home country and they're bringing them to America and they're building something that's bigger than them with it. We do know that Antonino Giamona, the spider at the center of Galati's web of troubles, had two sons sent to America in the late 1800s. And so the Sicilian Mafia's legacy spreads out across the Atlantic. One of those things they're passing down are these, these values and, and honor codes that might not totally chime with the laws of the land that they find themselves in. The Mafia didn't just create their own mythology. The American chapter even had a hand in the Godfather movie. And true to form, they even tried to control that too. They were kicking up a big stink about the film even before it was made and insisting that there'd be no use of the word Mafia or Cosa Nostra in it. And in fact, those words were hardly in the script anyway because I think, you know, it was quite well known. They weren't words that were used within the organisations themselves. The making of the film coincided with the founding of an organisation called the Italian-American Civil Rights League. 
which combated pejorative stereotypes of Italian Americans in the media. It should be noted that the Italian American Civil Rights League was founded by a man called Joseph Colombo. <laughs> And if that name sounds familiar, it's because he was also the head of the Colombo crime family, one of the five families of New York. So there's quite a rich irony there. In his negotiations with the producer of the film, Albert S. Ruddy, they seem to have got on quite well. And it was said that all of, you know, the, the production's problems with permits and unions just magically disappeared, as they have a way of doing when, uh, <laughs> when a friend of ours is involved. This wasn't the only part of the deal. Colombo would suggest members of his own organisation or his associates to play minor characters. So a lot of the minor characters in the film, which is the reason why they look so authentic, are genuine enforcers for the Colombo crime family. Most famously, Lenny Montana, who's the guy that plays Luca Brasi, as in Luca Brasi sleeps with the fishes. In fact, there's a lovely little detail, which is there's a scene in the first film where Luca Brasi goes to Vito Corleone to thank him for inviting him to his daughter's wedding. Um, and he's sort of stumbling over what he wants to say. And apparently the real um, Lenny Montana was so nervous about talking to Marlon Brando, you know, this great movie star, that he kept stumbling over his lines. So retrospectively, they went back and shot a scene where he was like practising what he was going to say to Don Corleone to make it look like that was real because he just couldn't get his lines right. <laughs> so they wrote that into the script. So the film was authentic in a way that suited the mafia, of course. It's a movie and, and it's drawing on all these classical traditions of, of heroism and, and so on and so forth. So it's not depicting the real gritty detail of the violence that has to happen to enforce an organisation like this. And, and they are, Vito Corleone is very much depicted as a much more principled, noble guy than a lot of the, you know, senators working for the government or certainly than the other heads of the crime families. And that included conveniently disposing of people who got in their way. People like Dr Galati, who was fighting to expose the Mafia back in Sicily for who they really were. Bullies, thieves and murderers. Now this finale to the story, Galati flees. He leaves Palermo, goes back to Naples, abandons his patients as a doctor, you know, his client list that he's built up over years and takes refuge on the mainland in Naples and hands over his testimony to the government. His testimony, not only that the Mafia existed, but that he, his family and workers, had been their direct targets. His thieving warden, Carollo, the police, and even Casumano, the man he nursed back to health, were all involved. They had already muscled their way into positions of power. But Galati's brave testimony achieved nothing. The establishment refused to acknowledge the existence of this deadly secret club. And the Mafia continued to hold incredible power in Sicily and across Italy for decades. As the 20th century drew to an end, for the first time, a concerted effort was made to put a stop to the political and economic power of the Mafia. And it began, of course, with violence. There was a brutal war in the early 1980s which saw an alliance of mafiosi grouped around the family of Corleone. Corleone's crew were responsible for the murders of over 200 mafiosa from other families in a grab for power and money. Because, of course, as we know, these were not men of honour, no matter how you dress it up. They were brutal gangsters. The state began to respond to this increased level of violence and the Mafia responded with violence to the state. Like a wounded animal dangerously lashing out, people were sick of it. For the first time they acted en masse. You had policemen, magistrates, judges, journalists, ordinary citizens who'd stood up to the Mafia even some mafiosi decided enough was enough. The Mafia War of the early 1980s produced a man called Tommaso Buscetta. And when many of the members of his family were murdered in this Mafia War, he turned state's evidence. <laughs> 
Breaking Omerta isn't anything new. Reneging on the code of silence even has a name. Pentito, meaning repentant. But this time, the Italian authorities wanted to do something about the Mafia once and for all. Busetta convinced them he had all they needed to bring the entire organization down. He found partners within the state who were ready to act, ready to believe him, ready to use his evidence systematically, ready to protect him. So his evidence was the cornerstone of this gigantic maxi trial, 470 odd accused. They had to build a special bomb-proof courtroom to hold the trial in, at which Buscetta gave his evidence. The prosecutor in the case was called Giovanni Falcone. He took evidence from Buscetta for 45 days. He found out everything. The initiation rituals, who was in the Mafia, and who the Mafia was buying off, including politicians and police officers. The trial lasted two years. When it finally ended, 338 mafiosi were convicted. Giovanni Falcone went on to work at the Ministry of Justice, creating investigative and policing and prosecuting systems specially designed to beat the Mafia. The Sicilian Mafia could only react with violence. A flagrant, violent, savage, re-advertising, reassertion of the authority. The story was about to explode. Anybody who was a sentient adult in the whole of Italy, let alone in Sicily, remembers where they were in the early evening of the 23rd of May, 1992, when they heard the news that Giovanni Falcone had been blown up by the Sicilian Mafia. Giovanni Falcone's wife and three of his bodyguards were also killed in the explosion. Now, at the time, that seemed like the ultimate victory of the Sicilian Mafia. It had murdered the Sicilian Mafia's greatest enemy. Actually, the reverse was true. It was too late. Falcone had already redesigned these investigative systems. He'd reorganized the way the Mafia was going to be fought. And since then, the fight against the Mafia has gradually ratcheted up. So, albeit tragically, albeit posthumously, Falcone won in the end. A month later, on the 19th of July, 1992, there were more nails in the coffin. Falcone's lifelong friend and colleague in preparing the evidence for the Maxi trial, Paolo Borsellino, was himself killed in a mafia bomb along with five members of his bodyguard who were all volunteers, every single one of them. That too made a devastating impression on public opinion. And in the final scene, it's the police, not the Mafia, who are immortalised forever as the heroes of this story. Just a small indicator of the status that these two heroes have in Italy now is that when you arrive in Sicily, you arrive at the Aeroporto di Palermo, Falcone e Borsellino. It's their names that were given to Palermo Airport. I suppose you could say that people like Falcone and Borsellino and the many other men and women who died fighting the Mafia in the bloody 1980s and early 1990s were the real men of honour in this story. The significance of the Maxi trial stretched way beyond putting a load of Mafia men behind bars. It achieved something that Galati had been unable to do all those years previously. The key thing about the Maxi trial 
is that when it eventually made its way through to the Supreme Court in Italy in 1992, it created a simple legal precedent, which was the Mafia exists. So, the Omerta Code had been broken. The secret was out. The Cosa Nostra was no longer their thing. It was everyone's thing. And it was everyone's problem. In Sicily, people began protesting in the streets. The Mafia were now the enemies of the people. Once their true nature had been revealed, and the myth stripped away. People finally stood up to the mafiosi and exposed them for who they really were, violent crooks and domestic terrorists. Brave people stood up to the mob and many paid with their lives. And they're the ones whose names have been immortalized as the true men of honor. Before we start, a little warning that there's some bad language, adult content, and quite a lot of violence in this series. No spoilers, but it is about gangs after all. Listener discretion is advised. The blistering sun shone that Thursday afternoon when the James Younger gang rolled into Northfield, Minnesota. This bustling mill town is over 500 miles from their home in Missouri. It's September the 7th, 1876, the year the United States celebrated its 100th birthday. The country had just been rocked by a violent and bloody civil war, which pitted Americans against Americans, neighbors against neighbors. But you'd never know it if you were strolling through the lively streets of Northfield on a day like today. A day that was the beginning of the end for the infamous Jesse James. Sometimes success isn't measured in money or longevity, but in how well you're remembered. And on that score, Jesse James has done pretty well. Like Britain's very own Robin Hood, he's remembered for stealing from those with a bit too much and giving to those who need more. And people loved him for it. Many still do. He was a real life gunslinger, an outlaw and he roamed the Wild West with his crew, the James Younger Gang. Well, he did until his good friend Robert Ford shot him in the back. But we'll get to the truth behind that particular story later. I'm Michael Caine, and for Audible Originals, this is Gangs. Episode five, Robbing the Rich. I was actually born in the heart of Jesse James country in northwest Missouri, 60 miles from where he was killed and less than that from where he was born, right in smack dab in the middle. Historian, author and musician Mark Lee Gardner has always felt a close connection to Jesse James. As a boy in the late 1960s, Jesse James was something of a hero. Um, it was still a hundred years past his first robbery, but he was a legend and he was celebrated. 
at recess, you went out to play, and a lot of times we portrayed historical figures, <laughs> and one of those that I wanted to be was Jesse James. He was this larger-than-life character from our part of the world. I mean, I even had, you know, reproduction Jesse James wanted posters on my wall uh, as a child in my room. The first historic site Mark remembers visiting as a child was Jesse James' home in St. Joseph, where he was killed. For, you know, a few pennies, I don't know if it was a dollar admission or 25 cents, you could go into the house. And of course, for a boy, this is like fascinating stuff. You have to picture this as a child, a young boy, and you're in the room where he was shot dead by the coward Robert Ford. And on the floor were all these scars and chips and marks on, and on the floorboards. And the tour guide explained that it was a tourist site from the day of Jesse's death. But the previous owner, when giving tours, would allow for a little bit more money. You could chip off a piece of the blood-stained wood. And the tour guide told us that he would have to replenish that blood periodically <laughs> using chicken blood. There's always someone there to make a quick buck out of a famous story. But this childhood experience never really left Mark. I still am drawn to this house, even as an adult. I've been back there several times. But on one of my recent visits, I went into the house, and they have a little gift shop out front. And in a box, they had all these wood shingles. And the this box said, these are the original shingles from Jesse's house, and they were $12 a piece. And it's like, decades later, I'm buying a piece <laughs> of Jesse's house, and, and I have that shingle. You know, I've saved that. So what was it that Mark found so appealing in the story of Jesse James? It sounds odd, but it was actually his success as a robber. I mean, had Jesse you know, robbed a bank and then been captured and spent the rest of his life in jail, that's not uh, hero material, right? But the fact that he was so successful over so many years and so many robberies, it's been estimated that, you know, between his run from 1869 to 1881 or so, him and his gang, committed maybe 19 robberies, and that was banks, trains, and stagecoaches. Mark turned his childhood fascination into a career. Decades later, and I've written this book about Jesse James and the Northfield Raid. Here's what happened on that September day in Northfield, Minnesota. It was around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and most people in Northfield were going about their normal things when gunfire suddenly breaks out in the streets. Somebody starts screaming, they're Robin robbing the bank. bank, and another one yells, grab, grab your, your guns, guns boys. boys. So the townspeople are running to the hardware stores or grabbing guns and ammunition. Let's get them! As the locals start to shoot, two of Jesse James's gang stationed as lookouts are sitting targets. These men are out there, literally a live action shooting gallery down Division Street, but they don't flee, they don't flinch. They're waiting for the men inside the bank. They're gonna stay out there as long as their buddies are in there. Mm. Looks like we stirred up a hornet's nest here. What do we do, Jesse? We shoot them back. And it's an amazing firefight. Uh, the citizens are shooting shotguns, they're shooting rifles. Those that can't get a firearm actually are picking up rocks and throwing them at the gang. Help! We're getting shot all to pieces! Hurry up in there! Come on, let's go! It's taking you long enough. They grab what money they can. Finally, the men come out, jump on their horses. They gallop out of town. They escape from the town and the angry hornets of townspeople that are firing after them. And what begins then is one of the greatest manhunts in United States history. Local families hide him and his gang in their barns. They feed them, clothe them, and cover their tracks when the authorities come calling. Jesse's community throws a cloak of invisibility over him. One of his regular hideouts is the home of a family called the Fords, including brothers Charlie and Robert. They love Jesse, and they can't believe it when he lets them join his gang. 
But on the face of it, Jesse James is a bank robber, a criminal. So why do all these law-abiding Missouri families support him? Well, that story really starts with the American Civil War. Jesse was just a teenager when it began, 14 years old, and he lived with his family right on the border between the Confederate South and Union North. It was where some of the war's most violent battles took place. Jesse remained at home while his older brother, Frank, went off to war to fight on the side of the anti-government rebels. But Jesse certainly didn't escape the brutality. Federal troops arrived at his farm and they tortured him trying to get information on his brother Frank. It was very bloody and it was very violent. Jesse suffered greatly at the hands of the Northern Union soldiers. Fired up by the experience, he soon followed in Frank's footsteps and joined the feared Bushwhackers, a guerrilla war outfit who fought on the side of the Southern Confederacy. Being a Bushwhacker, was a life-changing experience for Jesse. He just lived through a very traumatic, violent time. Then after the war's over, and this is his side of the story, they really weren't allowed to return to a normal life. Some of these young men who had fought were disenfranchised, and so they turned to the one thing that they were really good at. Raiding, running into towns, surprising the people, and and the bankers and the tellers, the trains, and getting away with a lot of money. Serving alongside Jesse and Frank in that battalion was another pair of brothers, Cole and Jim Younger. And together, they went on to form the James Younger Gang. To a beaten local population ground down by years of war and poverty, the plucky robbers were a revelation. Individuals looked towards them and saw them doing things they wished they could do. I mean, I wish I could do something to get back at the North, uh, and Jesse and Frank are doing those things. Jesse James generally got very good PR from the newspapers. It was something that was really awe-like, I mean, uh, not necessarily inspiring, but you were amazed that, that he could accomplish this. Even if the press weren't on the same side as Jesse, they showed a certain admiration, shall we say, for their audacity. For example, in 1876, the Rocky Cut train robbery really made a splash. They got away with $10,000 of cash, and there was a lot of press. I mean, they took all kinds of eyewitness accounts. I mean, people were fascinated by how this robbery was pulled off and they got away clean. And there was a posse that couldn't track them down either. But one of the newspapers commented that no one was hurt except for the express companies. You know, the express companies, they got lots of money, and these guys pulled off this daring thing and didn't harm a single individual on the train. And isn't this exciting? And wasn't that an adventure? And nobody lost except these big companies that are wealthy. So that makes it okay. So that was Jesse's secret to success and immortality, robbing from the rich. Fat cats, when the public's eyes could afford it. He was a hero of his time, but the legend of Jesse James endures to this day. He was on TV and he was in movies, comic books, and before comic books, of course, dime novels. There were probably more dime novels published about Jesse James than, than really any other historical figure. And they're all, you know, very garish and romanticized, but Jesse is always the hero. And even though the writers tried to point out that you know, what he did was wrong, but his heart was in the right place. <laughs> Nowhere is this more apparent than in one of America's most famous folk songs. <sighs> the Ballad of Jesse James, sung here by Mark himself. If Jesse was your friend, on him you could depend. If it be true, I am sure. He always wore the belt that would equalize the wealth. He would rob the rich for the poor. It was his brother Frank who robbed the Galton Bank and carried the money from the town. It was at that very place 
They had a little chase for they shot Captain Sheets to the ground. Jesse had a wife, the pride of his life. His children, they were brave. But the dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard has led Jesse James in his grave. The ballad itself tries to build up this image of Jesse as a family man because part of the chorus is Jesse had a wife, the pride of his life, and his children, they were brave. It's building sympathy for Jesse James. His wife was called Zerelda Mims, known as Z. She was mother to his two children, and she was also um, his cousin. He has a dramatic love affair with a cousin, but you know, I suppose we've all been there. I'm just kidding. Uh <laughs> Lydia Cooper is an assistant professor of English at Creighton University and has written extensively on Jesse James, his life of crime and his whirlwind love affair with Z. He falls in love with her while convalescing from a near-fatal wound. The story writes itself. It's so dramatic and romantic. And then he falls in love with her and they go off and marry and have a couple children. And he has to go and fight for his family, fight for his homestead, fight for his community. And of course, community is, is very kinship oriented around this time. And when the newspaper journalists came calling for interviews, Jesse was the head of the game. He was very intentional in how he crafted that image of himself as a highwayman, a gentleman robber. He's conventionally good looking. You know, I'm not sure how much of this was apocryphal, but he would often have these sort of witty banter discussions with the women whose jewels he would be taking and flirt with them. He's this dashing Robin Hood-esque character who is described as a highwayman of the West. So he was very much aware of the folk hero narrative that he was playing into. And part of that mythology was a newly popular genre of fiction, pulp Western novels, stories about handsome highwaymen. There's this author, Edward Wheeler, who publishes this series of pulp dime novels about Deadwood Dick called The Prince of the Road. The Dashing Dick first appeared in print just five years before Jesse James died. Wheeler's very much picking up on this mythologizing of a highway robber and giving them attributes of, you know, that sort of the, the myth of the, the Robin Hood character. So, you know, Deadwood Dick obviously is discovered to come from a well-to-do family in the East who's fallen on hard times and that's how he ends up in this life of villainy. And so we see some of those tropes getting picked up in the earliest dime novel versions of Jesse James as well. And the Pulp Westerns themselves drew on stories of British highwaymen. 17th century gentlemen robbers who would stop stagecoaches at gunpoint and rob noblemen of their riches. But in many ways, Jesse James is all American. His life spans a really interesting time period during a moment of identity crisis in the United States also during the extremely short time period that was the entire existence of the so-called Wild West. The Wild West is a term that takes me right back to spaghetti westerns of my youth. It sums up that era of pioneering Americans from the East Coast striking out into the unsettled parts of their continent. There was almost a religious fervor to their expansionism. It was their manifest destiny, as they called it, to spread democracy and capitalism across the land. In reality, the Wild West era only lasted about 30 years, but it's become a staple of American storytelling, especially in the cinema, and Jesse fits right in. Jesse, such a perfect embodiment of the myth of the Western outlaw. And of course, one of the first people to play Jesse James is Jesse James Jr. His only son, he played his old man in the 1921 film, Jesse James Under the Black Flag. Jesse's life has become the archetype for lead characters in Westerns. An anti-hero with a heart of gold, striking out against the big bad world. And through rugged individualism and those good looks, he comes out on top. 
and in doing so he becomes part of the American story, the iconic image of a lone rider with a cowboy hat. Every American president has had at least one photo op with a cowboy hat, which is an interesting visual. So it's one of those things that is interesting because the idea of the West and the Western hero was immediately fused to the idea of what it means to be American. And according to Lydia, what it means to be an American in the Wild West era is... A person who is sworn to good, who has this deep moral abiding integrity. And yet, because of the lawlessness and the wildness and the savagery of the place, may have to break a few rules. So America may sometimes get some things wrong, but gosh darn it, they have a heart of gold. But this classic story transcends America and Jesse James. It's a tale of the little guy who stands up to the man, just like Robin Hood and countless other folklore heroes across the world. Now, that story plays out in a lot of different ways and gets picked up in a lot of interesting moments historically when you have groups of people who are looking for a shorthand way to symbolize the energy of a person with nothing to lose who maintains that sort of moral center, the heart of gold. The London Irish punk band the Pokes covered the ballad of Jesse James for their 1985 album, Rum, Sodomy and the Lash. The Pogues, whose name, in case you didn't know, is short for a quaint little Irish term. Pogue Mahone, which uh, translates to kiss my ass in English. And it kind of sums up the ethos of the band. Spider Stacy from the Pogues. This is what we're doing and this is us, you know, and if you don't like it, you can kiss our ass, you know. <laughs> The Pogue's cover of the ballad was actually inspired by a Western. The Long Riders, um, directed by Walter Hill. And it was about the James Younger gang climaxing in the Northfield, uh, Minnesota bank robbery. And some cracking dialogue, very well cast. And there was just something about the feeling of the film. The whole thing made quite an impression on me, actually, the film. I became a bit obsessed with it. I've seen it many, many times. Jesse James, the song, um, plays out at the end of the film. The band would watch it over and over again on the tour bus. We started playing the song live. The story of Jesse James appealed to the Pogues. Us against the world, that has a certain appeal. And that sense of fighting against some sort of oppressive social order, you know, or bands should be like a gang, played into it a bit as well. Jesse James has come to represent so much to so many people. This folklore hero inspires the world over. But as with many outlaws, Jesse James met an untimely end. That end would be brought about by one of his own men, the coward, as he's known, Robert Ford. Mark Gardner explains. Robert Ford, who was this young gang member along with his brother, uh, Charlie, they had made a deal with the governor of Missouri, Governor Crittenden. Crittenden denied this later, but their deal was Jesse James dead or alive, never going to get a big reward. Meanwhile, at the same time, Jesse himself had decided it was time to retire. He's ready to jack it all in and hang up his holster. Jesse James had decided to give up the outlaw life. He had turned a new leaf and he had promised to his wife that he was going to become an honest man and, of course, try to live decently together with them for the rest of his life. On the 3rd of April, 1882, the 34-year-old Jesse, along with Charlie Ford, Robert Ford, Z, and Jesse's two children, are all in hiding. The cops are hunting for Jesse, dead or alive. The three men are in the living room discussing plans for retirement, dreaming of a quiet life settling down with their families. Little did Jesse know that his fellow gang members the people he trusted the most had other plans for his future. It's time for me to get out of this game, boys. Retirement, that's what's next for me. 
You retiring? I don't believe it. What were you doing all day? These bones are getting old, Charlie. Reckon I'll pass my time on the porch with Z pretty well. Jesse noticed that there was a picture on the wall, and this picture had a lot of dust on it. He took the little duster to it, knocked the painting askew, and so he had to get a chair. He was going to go up and straighten it and hang it properly. Bob and Charlie Ford saw Jesse, had, for some reason, had taken off his pistols and laid them on the bed, so he was unarmed. Now, help me get this straight. This was the Ford brothers' chance. While he was standing on that chair, both of them drew their guns, but Robert Ford fired first. Jesse! What have you done? And it just took that one bullet to the head and Jesse tumbled off. And that was the end of Jesse. They shot poor Jesse in the back. They're the heinous murderers, traitors, turncoats that have done Jesse in just at the time when he had seen the light and was getting ready to turn a new leaf. He was betrayed and murdered by a man who was like a brother slash son. And when the news broke, there was a public outcry. Immediately, people start making physical pilgrimage out to try and find artifacts from Jesse. His funeral became this event, that final punctuation to a life that was already dramatic. Bob Ford immediately cashes in on the drama. We have, you know, Jesse James, the real life man, real life murdered by Bob Ford, and suddenly we've got representations, performances of the assassination of Jesse James picking up almost right away. Robert and his brother Charlie performed reenactments of the assassination of Jesse James for sold out audiences in cities across America. Robert thought he would be treated as a hero. He just had these illusions of grandeur and, and celebration that he had killed the notorious Jesse James. And, and most people, even today, just saw it as underhanded and dirty. People were horrified at the way the brothers were cashing in on the murder. And surprisingly, their lives ended in tragedy too. Charlie Ford committed suicide. Many people believe it's you know his regrets over their participation in the assassination. Robert didn't fare much better. Bob's life is kind of in a tailspin afterwards. He just kind of jumps from one place to another, and then eventually he's murdered in Creed, Colorado. So it doesn't end well for Bob Ford. And this marks the end of the story of the great hero, Jesse James. But not the end of ours, because there's much more to the Jesse James story than first meets the eye. I bought into the whole Jesse James myth. Historical author Mark Gardner was obsessed with his folklore hero as a kid and returned to study Jesse James in greater depth as an adult. Well, I thought, you know, this is going to be kind of something special for me and, uh, and turn my skills as historian to the real Jesse James, the real outlaw. But the more he researched the more he uncovered a different Jesse James than the one portrayed in the films. Mark's book on the Northfield Raid revealed what really happened during the bank raid that day. Inside the bank, the three gang members, Frank James and Charlie Pitts and Bob Younger, met stiff resistance from the acting cashier, Joseph Lee Haywood. Open the vault! I can't. I don't know how. Open it! Frank James, he knew this was a stalling technique, and cashiers and tellers always tried to stall him by lying, and they were very used to this. Then it gets very violent. Joseph Lee Haywood really refuses to cooperate. I'm telling you, I can And they fire a gun next to his head, trying to scare him uh, into opening the vault. Is it right? Kill me! Robbing the bank. Oh, hell! Things are going awful inside the bank as they're trying to get to 
the money that they came for. Finally, one of the gang members, Bob Younger, pulls open a drawer to find just $26.50, which he pockets. But this whole time, the gunfire is increasing out on the street, and they're getting yelled at by Cole Younger. He says, come out, we're getting shot all the pieces. Finally, they rush out. One of the uh, tellers that was uh, in the bank at the time, he goes running out the back door, and Charlie Pitts shoots him and wounds him in the shoulder, but he escapes. That leaves the last gang member, Frank James, still inside the bank, along with the other teller, Joseph Lee Haywood, who has just managed to stop the gang getting into the safe. But as Frank James is getting ready to leave, he climbs up on the counter, and as he's stepping over the counter, he turns around and puts his pistol almost at point-blank range into Joseph Lee Haywood's head and murders him just in cold blood, just out of spite for the fact that Joseph Lee Haywood had thwarted them in their efforts to get into the safe. Not only did they murder an innocent man, but they didn't even pull off a successful job. One of the ironies, I guess you would say, of this robbery, not only did they just get $26.50, but that bank safe itself was open. It was not locked. And had Frank James gone ahead and gone into the vault and not wrestled with Joseph Lee Haywood and tried to scare him, and had he just tried that handle, he would have opened it up and there was $15,000 in cash. Meanwhile, outside the bank, two members are dead, laying on the streets, bleeding, and some of them have horrendous wounds from this shootout. They gallop out of town bloody, disheartened, and with only $26.50 to show for uh, their efforts. The robbery was a disaster. Due to the brave actions of Joseph Lee Haywood and the townsfolk of Northfield, Jesse's old gang had been destroyed, and he had to rely on untested new recruits, like the Ford brothers. And despite the romantic myth of robbing from the rich, the truth is that back then, it was a normal man on the street who lost out in these bank raids. This is a time before there's federal deposit insurance. So all these townspeople that have money in the bank know they're not getting it back. So it, it was not all the glory and romanticism. And on top of it, they didn't give their money to the poor. They kept it for themselves. And that's not the only example where fact that didn't quite live up to fiction. One of Jesse's favorite targets was the Pacific Lines, trains carrying the loot that the boys liberally helped themselves to. One of the ways that he fought the man was robbing Union Pacific lines when they came in with their payrolls for Union Pacific employees. So he was literally robbing the wages of working class Americans and he was not disseminating them to other people outside of his immediate family and the members of the gang. Not so much of a working class hero then, huh? <laughs> there is this myth of Jesse James that is so applicable to people who are struggling against enormous power and enormous wealth and who believe themselves to represent those who have no voice. And at the same time, Jesse James, the historical figure, is much more complicated than that. And he was much less in real life interested in representing the common people. He was much more interested in self-serving, in creating his own little small haven of safety and increasing his own wealth. And there's an even more troubling side to Jesse James. He's from slave-owning people. So there's a very obvious and sort of innate reason for why he ends up becoming part of the Confederacy. Jesse James' family owned slaves. And in the Civil War, he joined the bushwhackers on the side of the Confederacy, the southern states fighting to keep hold of their slaves. Jesse James really did lose a lot after the Civil War, culturally, and he was angry about it and he wanted it back. Now, what he lost was part of a culture that was based on owning other humans. It was a culture that was based on a belief that being white gave you rights to own things, to claim things that weren't yours. And according to Lydia, this disturbing ethos is what drove his criminal side too. This is the ideology that drove him to 
claim territory that wasn't his, to take things that weren't his. It's part of the context that historically he really was from. It is also part of the context that has to be forgotten in the myth if the myth is used to represent working class America fighting against the man, <laughs> which again is not really what he was about. And not only were the bushwhackers supporters of slavery, they were also infamous for their brutal tactics against the North. Their practices followed the practices of domestic terror groups. So what their goal was and their military practice was to instill terror, kidnappings, targeted assassinations. If you side with the Union, if you, you know, give sucker to Union soldiers or anything like that, you'll lose everything. I'll burn your barn down, that sort of thing. You want to also make sure that they don't ever think twice about supporting the Union cause. So, you know, you, you murder their child. We know that they did things like that. We know that Jesse James did things like that when he was an outlaw. He used the exact same tactics. So again, whether or not white supremacy was his main motivation, it was in the mix. This is the shocking truth behind Jesse James' real life history. The one that's been erased in westerns and dime novels. He was embodying these values and these attitudes of a fallen South, a defeated South, a South that was based on ideas of precedence and priority for white folks, both when he was fighting as a bushwhacker and also when he was an outlaw. This is a man who is part of his particular culture and he bought into it. He did not brush it off. And yet that mythology that picks up on Jesse James, the outlaw hero who represents the common man, that part of his identity gets conveniently forgotten. As a nation, we continue to struggle with this myth that is so pervasive about American history and what it means to be American. And the historical, familial, deeply intimate and grotesque violence that is part of American history and has been for centuries. Spider Stacy from the Pokes also revisited his notion of Jesse James and the ballad as an older man. I had a problem with doing Jesse James. The man himself is completely reprehensible. I sort of saw that it had recently been covered by Neil Young and was willing at that point to sort of say, think, well, maybe the, you could view the song as being possibly separate to the man. But I don't know that that holds, really. I, it makes me th definitely uncomfortable because he was what he was. What I would say I do regret, possibly, is turning a convenient blind eye, perhaps, to the reality, which back in, even back in 85, you know, if you just, like, looked at it a little bit closely, the, it's, it's all there. It's not like history has changed in the intervening years. He's always been a bastard. He's always been a little racist thug, you know. Needless to say, Spider has long retired Jesse James. Manisha Sinar is chair in American history of the University of Connecticut and a leading authority on the history of slavery and the Civil War and Reconstruction. It's been interesting for me to compare the myths around him and the reality of his history, where he represents a part of American history that we might want to sanitize or forget. And that includes a history of racist terrorism, a history of people like Jesse James, who was really a pro-slavery, neo-Confederate terrorist being valorized as some sort of outlaw who was taking on bigger powers in his life. What then does Jesse James tell us about what it means to be an American? If you look at his life, the actual life and not the mythic one, he is born into a small slaveholding family in a border slave state in Missouri, where there is a lot of debate over the uh, future of slavery. You have some Missourians, like Jesse James and his immediate family, being extremely committed to slavery and the spread of slavery to the West. During the Civil War, 
he becomes part of what was known in Missouri as the bushwhackers who are involved in all kinds of atrocities, sacking towns, killing innocent civilians, scalping them even, killing wounded and injured Union Army soldiers, which is really a war crime. And he builds his brutal reputation, especially in the period immediately after the Civil War, where Southern whites literally engage in a mass campaign of racist terrorist violence to undo the results of the Civil War, emancipation and black rights. Jesse James manages to sort of reinvent himself as a heroic figure, as an outlaw, as a rebel. And his reinvention is part of a larger reinvention of the Confederacy and of many violent terrorists that existed at the same time, like the Ku Klux Klan. All these people were doing exactly the same thing. Uh, They were reinventing themselves as heroic figures, as downtrodden figures who were fighting against greater powers than themselves. And by glorifying these violent racist terrorist figures as somehow heroic individualistic figures like Jesse James or as uh, people who have somehow saved the South from what they called, quote, Negro rule, which really just meant that black people were allowed to vote because they didn't really rule anywhere as such. If we ignore the whole Jesse James story, then we also ignore the real story of America. And so when we look at Jesse James' story, we need to put his story in this context, in this broader historical context of the Civil War and Reconstruction. And then you can understand why is it that today we get this mythic narrative about him as opposed to the actual historical facts. And this is a legacy that the United States is still grappling with. You know, on the one hand, he sort of cultivates this image of himself as that lone gun-toting cowboy. On the other hand, he also represents the violent and brutal aspect of the settlement of the West. Some of the biggest misconceptions about the so-called Wild West, the manifest destiny, included the brutal subjugation and dispossession of Native Americans, the Plains Indians of the West during this time period. We normally don't think of that when we think about the West. We think of the sort of heroic conquering lone individual cowboy, you know, the lone gunsman. And actually that image conceals more than it reveals about Western history, because the actual history is actually pretty violent and brutal and based on vast systems of exploitative labor. The danger of erasing parts of history means we are bound to repeat the same mistakes. I think it is very important for us to even reach out to people who may admire Jesse James to tell them the real story because the image of the cowboy hides more than it reveals about the story of the West. Just recently, we have witnessed in the United States a glorification of the Confederacy and Confederate monuments and statues. Uh, You really wouldn't see that in Germany when it comes to Hitler and Nazi flags and symbols. There are no statues to Hitler, but it's only after the murder of George Floyd and the takeoff of the movement for black lives that many of these statues have come down. So this kind of unreconstructed, completely obdurate white supremacist strain has existed in the United States, certainly since slavery, the war and its aftermath. But it is a very dangerous strain that at various times in American history has posed a real threat to the rule of law. It is important for us to know the real story and why I think there is no redeeming qualities to mythic representations of the past by Jesse James. Knowing all we do now about the real Jesse James, let's go back to that scene of his murder at the hands of the coward Bob Ford and let's replay it to find out what really happened. Jesse James, by this time, 
had become extremely paranoid. He was being hunted everywhere. And Jesse read in the paper where one of his associates apparently had turned evidence and was talking to the governor. And Bob and Charlie Ford started worrying that maybe Jesse has figured out that we're out to get him. And they were afraid that Jesse was going to kill him. On the 3rd of April, 1882, the 34-year-old Jesse, along with Charlie Ford, Robert Ford, Z, and Jesse's two children, are all in hiding. The cops are hunting for Jesse, dead or alive. Jesse noticed that there was a picture on the wall, and this picture had a lot of dust on it. He took a little duster to it, knocked the painting askew, and so he had to get a chair. He was going to go up and straighten it and hang it properly. Bob and Charlie Ford saw Jesse, had, for some reason, had taken off his pistols and laid them on the bed so he was unarmed. They were waiting for Jesse to take his guns off. This was their chance. While he was standing on that chair, both of them drew their guns, but Robert Ford fired first and it just took that one bullet to the head and Jesse tumbled off and that was the end of Jesse. People can hate the way Jesse was killed all they wanted and I guarantee you people at the time did. They thought it was a horrible thing, this kind of, you know, government assassination of the robber. And the thing is, Jesse wasn't planning to retire at all. He couldn't let go of the criminal lifestyle. The buzz of the bank robberies and the adulation of the press but had Jesse not perished at that moment, he was going to go to Platte City and rob a bank. And we just don't know how many people or if one individual might have been harmed or hurt or shot and killed in that robbery. So probably Bob and Charlie Ford saved, certainly saved a crime, if not some kind of fatality by ending Jesse's career. But in ending Jesse's career, they birthed a legend. A legend that was too good to be true. His success as the gangster hero was a lie, and one that's been told so many times that Jesse James had become a symbol for something greater than he ever was, the all-American Western hero in a cowboy hat. It's important to tell the whole story of our historical heroes, even if they turn out to be not what we thought they were. Because if we don't look at the whole story, we might get lost in the nostalgia for a time that never existed, for a time that was great. Before you listen to this episode, we think it's important you know that it features some very adult content, including references to suicide. And there's also talk about abuse and violence. And with that, let's begin. We're in London's West End. We've been here before, back in episode one with the Cray Twins. That was in the 1960s and this is the 90s, but this bit of London is still all about having a good time. We actually used to go clubbing, because everyone was young. But people turned a blind eye. And I'm talking about the West End scene. We used to get into nightclubs, wouldn't show no ID. Tracy. She's only a teenager, but she walked straight in and the mood of the whole place changes as she does. She might be young, but she looms large. I was used to making money very quickly and very easily. And it became addictive. People started to fear me. Tracy is the real life subject of this episode. You'll get to hear firsthand what life's like at the very top of a gang how it motivates you, and how it changes you forever. But when Tracy was just 15 years old, 
She can walk into any club round here and be treated with the same mixture of respect and fear. Just like the craze all those years ago. For this final episode, I've decided to come home to South London. It's reported that the streets of London are becoming more violent by the day. Gang culture is on the rise. But is that true? Are today's gangs really more successful than ever? I'm Michael Caine. And for Audible Originals, this is Gangs. Episode 6, No More Heroes. I grew up in the 40s and 50s in what was then a South London slum, in the quaintly named Elephant and Castle, known locally as the Elephant, if you had the misfortune to grow up there. The River Thames divides North and South London straight through the middle. The North side is mostly the posh side, the Elephant is on the South. This is Brixton. As is Brixton, where Tracy and her friends grew up. What we all had in common was that we were angry. We were angry at society, we were angry at life. We'd been dealt a bad hand and we didn't know how to process that. Brixton, like the Elephant, was a poor working class area. When you live in a housing state with a lack of opportunity, you look up to the older kids, the ones who rule the block. I remember meeting them for the first time and I just found these guys so amazing. I just found their whole swagger. The way they looked, the way they spoke, the way they carried themselves, everything just seemed different. They weren't like the usual boys I was used to around my way. You could see they had a level of class and that amazed me. There was no formal initiation, it just happened. I just went with the flow. It wasn't something I was even aware of. This isn't the Mafia. There are no family firms and sacred ceremonies. It's just friends hanging out, learning from each other, working with each other. The main source of income would generate from robberies, businesses. The thing is, we had morals, things like Seen a lady on the street taking her handbag at knife point, not at any point. That's a no-go. So there was a certain honour among these thieves. Or so they thought. When you're young and you're warped-minded, you think that there's victimless crime. Businesses, shops, all those types of things, it was seen as victimless crimes because the notion was whatever you take, the insurance will replace from them. So it almost felt like, well, they'll be all right. A lot of money was generated from those types of businesses. And then as things moved on and time moved on, I went into drug selling. Again, this isn't a billion dollar racket of an international cocaine ring, but Tracy wasn't doing too badly for a Brixton girl. There were some days that you'd come back feeling super rich because you're counting thousands of pounds as a youngster. And even more so, 50 pound notes. It's like, wow, what do I even do with this, actually? It was mind blowing, to be fair. I became an addict to the adrenaline that I got from committing the crimes because think about it, you're a young teenager and you're going into what I'd say is businesses and you're scarpering with a lot of money. Money that you can't even comprehend yourself. It's what some would earn a month, depending on if it's a good day or a bad day. But just being able to be quick-witted on your feet, get in, get out, and go home. And obviously you have to hide this stuff from mum. She was law-abiding. So having to be a different character and hide who you really are from your own mum to an extent, even that was hard, but that was still a part of the adrenaline rush. Tracy was robbing from the rich, just like Robin Hood, and bringing money back home to help out her family 
and with that came a bit of extra cash to treat herself too. The things I'd used to spend money on would be designer goods. I couldn't even pronounce them properly at the time. I used to call it Farsace, but it's obviously Versace. Moschino, Dolce & Gabbana was a favorite of mine. And other youngsters would notice you because you had garments that they couldn't afford or would not be able to wear. And I lived and I thrived off that. It made me feel like, okay, I'm not a part of the lower class anymore. Actually, I'm a part of the upper class because I can afford things that they can. So once again, it was all warped, but this was the young 15 year old that I was. Tracy and her friends were local celebrities. Brixton was theirs. And whatever was in Brixton was theirs to take. I think at a stage I managed to be like a VIP person. I'd be like, right, who am I going to go and antagonise now? So that could lead to me maybe going to the local pizza shop and whenever I went over there, they just knew, OK, look, let's just sort this girl out, just give her whatever she wants and she'll leave. I felt like I, I was being assertive. Somebody had to deal with this from me. So I got off on that. I would just let them know, it's either you're going to give me what I need and what I want when I want it, or I'll just take what I want from here at any given time. And there's nothing you can do to stop me. So you decide. And of course, aggression became a regular part of Tracy's life. When I was a young teen, I was very violent. Violence was all I knew. I was raised around violence. Violence became a way of life. Carrying knives. When you are on the streets and you're active, you, you carry it for just in case. You're not sure that that day is going to come, but you don't want to be in a situation where you don't want to be without it. So if you can picture other youngsters feeling that way, before you know it, you've got a whole team of youngsters with this warped mindset, which can become very dangerous because then if maybe youngsters from another side of town have that mindset also, what exactly is gonna happen when these two teams or cliques or crews, when they meet? We all know what happens. We've seen it on the news. We've read it in the papers. But for Tracy, it was her everyday reality. I've used a knife more than once to stab someone. Um, it's no secret. There was this young particular uh, chap. I didn't like his tone, so actually I ended up um, stabbing him. Now, after I did that, I left the scene. But bearing in mind, I was a well-known person, so it didn't take long for that to get to the police and for them to come and arrest me maybe a couple of days later. But as you can imagine, when youngsters heard about that, they definitely feared me. I suffered violence also. I've been stabbed in the hand. I was shot when I was 16 by a sawn off shotgun. I've had a couple of physical fights so I definitely experienced violence. I was on the other side of violence, 100%. We heard from Dr. Jeffrey Muirer earlier in this series. He's a senior lecturer at St. Andrews University in Scotland. His work analyzes gangs and importantly, what drives people to join them. We're talking about largely boys, but also girls, maybe at the age of nine or 10, who are being told they have no future, or they're being told that their future is extremely limited. What do you do if you don't think you have access to recognition? Saying to someone, do well in school, you'll get a good job and you'll get out of here, maybe. What do you do when school just isn't for you? Or what do you do if the school is crowded, violent, chaotic, there's no understanding of a relationship between an education and economic prospects. Especially, what do you do if you're in a neighborhood that is so clearly economically deprived? And here we can instantly see the attraction of the recognition of being in 
a gang. Because if there's no alternate avenue to social capital accumulation, there's no alternate incentive to join any other organization. Social capital is absolutely essential to understanding why gangs persevere, why gangs reproduce, why gangs continue, and why intervention programs that simply say, turn away from the gang, aren't successful. To reiterate, social capital dictates where a person sits in the society in which they live. Let's take a working class kid in London who is black, like Tracy, for example. They're not gonna have the same opportunities as a white kid with a posh accent going to a private school. They will have fewer connections, less education, and in some cases, less respect in wider society. The more social capital you have, the more opportunity. As we've heard before, the lure of a gang isn't just about succeeding, it's about belonging. We see a paradox, because so often people think of gangs as being antisocial, but they're not. They're highly social. They're violent, but they're often violent in violent spaces. They are violent, period. I do not apologize for that. But if you're a young person who grows up in an environment of violence, then the violence of the gang isn't all that different. My anger came from having to be in a household where my mum was a manic depressive. Now they call it bipolar. Back then they didn't have the right word or maybe terminology or even didn't understand it. Because this was a good few years ago. But mum was the sweetest lady ever when she was of sound mind. But as soon as she had a mental breakdown, she became the most violentest lady that anyone could ever witness. And even as a youngster watching this character turn from one being to another, it threw me. There was a time where mum had to be sectioned by her doctor and the doctor brought the police for reinforcement and it took 12 officers to contain this one woman that was slim. Anytime mum felt like she was gonna be sectioned or her back was against the wall, the first thing she would do would be to go and get a knife from the kitchen drawer. So I grew up thinking that if you are in a situation where you are out of control and your back's against the wall, you need to protect yourself and in doing that, you'd need a weapon, which would be knives in the kitchen. But it wasn't just Tracy's mum who scared her. My father was also incarcerated. This is my biological father. So he's been in prison for like 35 plus years. So I had a stepdad in the home and he was what I will call a paedophile. And what I mean by that is he would come out of the shower, like open his dressing gown and wave his erection at me. As a young girl, I didn't know what an erection was, but I knew it was a frightening thing and I knew it was wrong. And I started to put knives under my pillow, thinking that if there's a day that he comes in here into my bedroom when I'm trying to sleep to try and touch me, then I'm, I'm fully well gonna attack him. So I just felt like Life's dealt me a bad hand, and I just took my anger to the streets. Tracy's growing up in a terrible situation, feeling scared, angry and alone. She sees gang life as a way to make something of herself, to be a bit more powerful, to get some respect and some cash. She's not that different to lots of people we've met in this series. But there's an important difference at play here. You see these kids? They're a different type of gangster. Dr. Anthony Gunter is a criminologist who has specialized in violent crime for the past couple of decades. One of the things about gangs is it's racialized. You know, when we think about gangs, what we really are talking about, we're talking about black kids, or in America, we're talking about black and brown Latino kids. 
and unlike the gangs of the past, often glorified in films and books, today's gangs are viewed very differently. Even crime was better before because this issue of immigration didn't exist. We didn't import this horrible, violent criminality which was othered, which was different to the violence and crime that we knew. And so the people who now talk about gangs, it's almost like a code to say, when you see these kids, they're a different type of gangster. The white craze of this world, their kind of criminality was all right. So when we talk about gangs today, you know, they haven't got the same nice white values of these criminals. They have black values. And these black values are just, they're just mindless, violent thugs. But of course, these kids are now born here. They've got British passports, but we can still other them and say they're a problem from their behavior and separate it from, to say, look, they're criminals, fine. But look, we've had criminals, but they weren't like them. Gang expert, Jeffrey Muir. I think that there is a, a level of racism in the way that both the police, the public, and the culture industry deal with gangs. Who are the scary gangs? Who are the threats? Who are the ones that need to be dealt with immediately? And I think it comes down to public perceptions. And some of those public perceptions are the ways that we might see different groups treated for a very long time. So in the United States, just maybe to use the ready-made example, because it's so popular in so many films, Italian Americans were not seen as American throughout the late part of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. Italian Americans were largely seen as threats, whether it be as a racial threat or a labor threat or an economic threat, uh, but they were definitely not seen as American. By the 1970s, Italian Americans are understood to be American. When I look back at what happened to me when I was younger and the fact that, yes, I got involved with a gang over there and yes, I got involved and started running a gang over here and it became more important than a lot of things. Tracy started to leave her old life behind as she got more and more sucked into gang life. Even friendships were lost along the way because some of my friends weren't cool with what I was doing. So I was like, well, sod ya, off you go. No one needs you anyway, which is sad. I made the bad choices I did because I felt like, if I'm really honest with you, I didn't think that I would live to the age of, I don't know, maybe 30. I felt like if I lived that life of crime, I'm either gonna be incarcerated or I'd lose my life. And at the time, to get away from mum and the things that I was going through and facing my reality, prison felt good. I even thought if I was killed, if I was murdered, that would get me away from the life I was living. And it's sad, but that's how I felt at the time. Tracy couldn't see a way out of the life she was committed to. And as her life reached rock bottom, she even attempted suicide. I took an overdose and I went and laid down in my bed and thought that I just won't wake up and I don't need to explain this to anyone and it'll just look like she just drifted away in her sleep and I just thought the world would be a better place, mum would be a better person for it and my siblings, you know, they'd understand. But you know, sometimes you can want for something to happen but it doesn't go your way because God is the best of planners. So I woke up in hospital and um, there was a doctor there saying to me, you know, I need to talk to you because you're so young. Um, you know, why did you try to take your life, et cetera, et cetera. But they also told me that we've ran some tests and you're pregnant. And I was like, what did you say? They were like, you're pregnant. I was thinking to myself, oh my God, what am I gonna do now? Not only have I not successfully taken my own life, I've brought another life into the world or about to. So I thought, all right, look, um, it's time to just sort yourself out. And I just knew I've got to give this child the best life that she can have. I can't let the cycle repeat itself. <laughs> 
And from that moment, I decided that I was going to be a mum. I decided I was going to be a mum away from all of that. And that's what made me leave all of that stuff behind. Tracy's come back from the brink of death and the new life growing inside her has finally given her the motivation to change her own life, to leave the gang behind. Tracy's tale is really a story of our time. We hear a lot about gangs today in the papers on social media, about knives, about violence, about drug running, particularly in the big cities. And it certainly feels like gang violence is on the increase. But is that true? In previous decades, I think the country was much more violent. If you talk about the 1970s, 1980s, and the media didn't report about it, but if you lived in particular working class communities, violence was everywhere. It wasn't necessarily a gun, but it could have been a knuckle duster, it could have been a baseball bat, it could have been a razor, it could have been a brick. You know, violence was everywhere. It was commonplace, but it just wasn't necessarily reported in the news media because maybe there wasn't as many news outlets as there are today. I mean, when I was growing up, we had, you know, three and a half channels. You know, you had ITV, BBC One, and then you had BBC Two from the evening. There wasn't really that many news outlets where you would have this news cycle. So, you know, I think that probably says more about violence than violence itself. It's the same violence as it ever was. But when Tracy does it, we call it gang violence. Although talking to Tracy, what's really interesting is that she hardly ever uses the word gang. I've spoken to police officers. This whole gangs debate is a pile of nonsense and it's taken down a rabbit hole that doesn't exist. And I've actually spoken to police officers who say they don't agree with this whole gangs discussion. And we have to remember that the Metropolitan Police Service or any police service is about getting resources. So if you say there's gangs, you have resources attached to it internally. And so, if a violent crime happens in London, in the Elephant, in Brixton, other areas with a large working class black community, before the source of the crime has even been confirmed, often police will send a specially designated gang unit to the scene. Why would you call in Trident Gang Command? You don't know. It could have been that the shooting could have been a guy shooting his wife, shooting his girlfriend. It could have been a guy shooting someone over anything. Why are we assuming it's got anything to do with gangs? Surely you do your investigation and then you find out it's gang related and then you take it from there. But they don't. As soon as they, they think it's a certain area where there's black people, so if it's Hackney, Brixton, and there's a shooting or stabbing, they get in the gang unit. But it might have anything to do with gangs. One area of gang warfare that we often hear about in the UK news is the postcode wars gangs from different areas of London engaging in violent fights with each other. If you have this idea of post-Cold Wars, they say, so someone from one area of London fights someone from another area of London, OK, but that's always been thus, territoriality. You know, when I was at school, what my school would fight, it's cool down the road. You've got football hooligans in the UK or soccer hooligans for the international audience. And if you support Manchester United, you know, you're going to be fighting with supporters from Manchester City. Are you a gang or are you football hooligans? So what makes a gang and what makes a football hooligan? And the only thing that separates all of these other types of organised criminal activity from a street gang is the fact that one is black, one is racialised. So violence has always been territorial. But certain territories are changing. These poor neighbourhoods attract people who can live in them, who are poor people. And the opportunity that these poor people have tend to be around criminality, crime, underground economy. But previously, these poor communities could move up and out, which would then leave space for new poor communities to come in, and then they would do the same. The problem we have today is that that moving in and out is gone for these poor people because of gentrification. This is prime real estate. Areas of London and other global cities that were traditionally poor are now becoming desirable. Even the elephant, where I grew up. And with gentrification comes a higher police presence. <laughs>
the police are seen as an occupying force in these communities in the sense that the unwritten rule is it's a very rich city we've got lots of tourists lots of money make sure that this crime this concentrated poverty and crime stays in the borders so the police are doing a service to ensure that criminality and poverty stays in that little square mile of that housing, social housing estate. And it's only when it starts to spill out that the police will then say, this has to change, we've got to do something about this. So the community are aware that the police are disproportionately policing them. Organised crime, like every other major business today, is global. Jeffrey Muir. Looking at the role of the gang in the criminal enterprise is thinking about scale. Where are we looking? Are we looking at the street and seeing street level activity? Or are we looking at a much, much larger picture, which is about global circulations? If we concentrate on gangs on a street level, we are ignoring a much larger problem whether that's global circulations of financial capital in terms of large scale credit card fraud global circulations of drugs, whether it be from the Americas or from Asia into Europe, or global networks of moving people, whether those people are coming from sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Europe, or the Middle East. Tracy, and all these kids who were reportedly the gangs of today, are not part of these huge international organisations. Amorphous, loosely organised networks that move incredible amounts of money we don't even recognize because they're not tied up in these other more visible kids on street corners. That becomes what's sold in the newspaper. These huge and complicated corporate networks that span different continents, well, they don't make for easy stories. What motivates the media from, you know, not investigating or discussing large scale criminal networks or you know organized crime and you know it's an interesting question about whether that in and of itself would sell newspapers i mean it, if we're talking about investigating the the depth of the parasitic global network and the ability of you know say swedish biker gangs who are largely responsible for the distribution of very illicit drugs in scandinavia their ability to contract with a contractor in rotterdam who's able to contract with a chinese shipper who's able to get heroin from Thailand onto the container in Singapore that then ends up in Rotterdam, that then means that this biker gang in Uppsala is able to move product. Is that interesting? Maybe, but it almost seems like it's more of a story for the business page than it is for the front page, or certainly for the crime page. And maybe that's the secret of these organised crime network success. They're kind of boring. The people whose names we know whether they're fictitious, like Vito Corleone, or they're real people, Pablo Escobar, or the craze. We know their names because the networks come undone. They either become Icarus, right? They're too hubristic. They think they can run everything, and then they're betrayed, or law enforcement finally catches up with them. I mean, there are all kinds of ways that these figures come down, but it's in their fall that we remember their story. And what we love are great stories. Tracy's noticed it too. There are people that would turn their noses up at gangs and gang violence and what these youngsters are doing, but they would equally sit down with a cup of tea and biscuits and happily watch James Bond and films like that. Now, I grew up watching James Bond, 007. Who doesn't like 007? It's a franchise, it's a household name, but actually he's an assassin. And it's almost like, are the lines blurred? Because at home on a Sunday or whenever they're being showed, we can watch this and there's guns, there's money, but nobody has anything bad to say about James Bond. But yet, when youngsters are trying to live out what they've seen, maybe in films like this, or they're acting out because things are not right at home, they're very quickly judged and there's no empathy for them. I find that strange. We've heard a lot in this series about gang movies, like The Godfather, The Craze, even Westerns. When you do see films, I can see why youngsters will get caught up in wanting to try and live that lifestyle. Especially anything to do with 
drugs and the cartel. You do think it's reachable, you think it's a reachable lifestyle. And don't we all love the story of gangsters, no matter how old? Is culture in part to blame for our fascination with gangs? Am I, in my depiction of gangsters, villains and violent characters of all stripes, partly to blame? Our film and TV expert, Ellen E. Jones. Cinema has a very complicated relationship with violence because it is a visually exciting spectacle and a psychologically exciting spectacle and we're very uncomfortable admitting that to ourselves. <laughs> The story arc is traditionally always about the rise and fall, and that means you get to have your cake and eat as an audience member. You get to see all the glamour and the excitement of the amassing of power and wealth, and then you get to feel morally vindicated and justified when they get their comeuppance in the end. The devil has all the best tunes. Since John Milton wrote Paradise Lost and made Satan the star of it, we've been fascinated by charismatic villains. We want to see them rise, but we also want to see them fall as well. That's about resolving that conflict between identifying with a criminal and disapproving of them at the same time. This is a very relatable human story because all of us die in the end. <laughs> so we all have our fall in the end. But not all gangsters fall in a blaze of gunfire. Some manage to reinvent their lives, like Tracy Miller. We left her lying in a hospital bed, deciding to leave her life of crime behind, focus on being a mum and start giving back. I felt a sense of relief when I made that decision because I felt like I could finally be me, the person that I really should be. So I made that conscious decision that there must be a way that I can use what I've been through for some good. After Tracy turned her life around, she wanted to do what she could to help others. So that's when I started to do youth work. And it was nice. It was nice to be able to engage with a young person, not dictate to them, but engage with them and let them know the life you're living, actually, you're not going to have anything to show for it in years to come and you can be so much more. And youngsters, they're so quick to say, well, what do you know? You haven't lived it. To be able to turn around and say, well, actually, little do you know, I lived worse than you did. And I'm telling you, 100%, you need to change. Tracy found that these young people are more likely to listen to her because she's on their level. They're not interested in listening to people who've got suits on that may have passed a degree in that field telling them what they should be doing. They can relate to people who have lived that life, who have been through it, know it, can have empathy for them and see their viewpoint. This is from the heart. This is my way of giving back to society. People expected my eldest to be like a mini me of what I was. I can tell you now, she's never, ever been arrested by police. She doesn't have a criminal record. I kept her away from that life. And even when I came out with my story and she started to hear about what I used to do, we had to sit down and have some deep conversations. And she even asked me, mum, why would you like that? And I think that was one of the most heartbreaking things I've had to do was actually explaining to my daughter why I was the way I was. Cringe, you know? And her daughter took a very different path to Tracy. Upon leaving school, she passed her GCSE, she went to college, she passed whatever she was studying at the time. I'm proud of her because she accomplished something that I didn't do. She stayed on the straight and narrow. I understand the attractiveness of being in a gang myself. When we were kids, we didn't feel safe and we banded together for protection we joined a gang. And society didn't understand us then, and it doesn't understand kids today. And if people don't understand the fundamental reason why people join gangs and don't empathize with them, they're never gonna be able to successfully stop gang violence. 
I don't miss being that angry young person that I was because I never should have been it. I shouldn't have lived that life. I know that. And even then, my conscience kept telling me, but I didn't listen. The only thing she does miss are the friends that she lost. Victims of a gang lifestyle that, far from being glamorous or exciting, was full of tragedy and heartbreak. To be able to see what they would have made out of their lives and the children that they could have had, that's something to think about. But anything else? No, I'm, I'm glad I left it behind. And I just wish that I did that a lot sooner and even more so, just didn't engage in that lifestyle, full stop. This is the new me. You have been listening to Michael Caine, Gangs. An Audible original produced by Seven Digital. It was presented by me, Michael Caine, and was produced by Richard Power. The assistant producer was Ellie Lazaridis, and the executive producer was Hannah Marshall. Sound production was done by Matt Peaty and Charlie Brandon King. Kerry Luter and Nikki Cannon managed the production. Original music was composed by Jack Leonard, David Ralph, and Hugh Livingstone. I'll let the cast of villains and ne'er-do-wells over the series introduce themselves. Barnaby Edwards. Jonathan Keeble. Matt Addis. Laura Cucurulo. Federico Luo. Kate Padilla. Giovanni Noto. Daniel Antonini. Hannah Douglas. Aoife Smy. Horrible Batch. For Audible, the executive producer was Michelle Martin. The production executive was Haley Nathan. And the commissioning editor was Matt Willis.